Wow. 81 years old. Happy birthday. Thank you. In which war did you serve and which branch of the service? Served in the Navy, uh, World War II, and the Korean War. What was your highest grade? Sewn armor in second class. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? In Bristol. Bristol, Connecticut? Yes. Why did you enlist? I don't know. I just had the urge, that's all. And my mother let me go, so. How old were you at the time? I think I was 17. So, that was underage. Did your mother have to sign for you? Yes. Why did you pick the Navy? Because I was afraid of snakes and I was afraid of being in the Pacific where there were snakes. So I chose the Navy. Do you recall your first days in service? Oh, yes. What was that like? Well, it was sort of a nightmare. Uh, I enlisted in New Haven and uh, we left late in the afternoon by train to Penn Station and we had to wait in Penn Station, I don't know, maybe two, three hours. And we finally boarded a, a, two, a troop train. And uh, it, it, was, it was almost chaos at Penn Station with all of the wives and the girlfriends because we picked up a lot of other people in, in New York City. And the goodbyes and everything, it, 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 was, uh, it was sad. And, you know, the women were hanging on. And uh, we rode this troop train all night long through the uh, Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania going up to Sampson, New York. This was January. It was cold. Cold and dirty because, you know, there were, there were steam locomotives and uh, the smoke and coal dust was coming through the windows. And, you know, we arrived at Sampson, New York, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning, maybe even earlier. And they backed the troop train right in on the uh, on the base, and they had sort of a makeshift band that welcomed us. <laughs> what base was that? Sampson. That was the name of it. Did you spell that? S A M P A S O N, New York. It's uh, it's on the Finger Lakes. It's near uh, I think uh, Geneva, New York, in that area. So was January, and uh, what year? Forty four. So they had a band waiting for you? Yeah, sort of a makeshift band, you know. It wasn't, we were so tired and dirty and exhausted. So when you got on base, what happened? Well, then we went through a, a basic training, which was, um, I, I have to say, Samson, New York, it had, there were like five, I think there were five major areas where you trained, and, we, and of course we were just in one of them. And they had, you know, wooden two-story barracks, typical World War II, uh, with a coal stove for heat. And with a, they called it a grinder. It was a track. It was probably three-quarters of a mile around, large area. And uh, basic training was 14 days. Fourteen days? That was it? That was it. What did you learn in that fourteen days? Well, you learned basic seamanship. Of course, I, I had I had boats. I had, you know, and I was familiar with a lot of it, the knot, knot tying and uh, what life aboard ship would be like and so forth. And, but, you know, it was very basic. Fourteen days of training and fourteen days of leave. And then... You went back and... Uh, Did you go home to Connecticut on your 14th? Oh, yes, yeah. And then you went back to Geneva? Went back and uh, was sent to uh, Key West, Florida, to Sonar School. And that was another experience, riding the train for I don't know how many hours during the night and so forth, down to Florida, get into Miami, 
and here we are where there were probably 50 of us standing there in our in our dress blues and 80 degree weather <laughs> and uh, put us on a Greyhound bus and off we went to Key West. Now in those days most of the roads were dirt going to Key West and the wooden bridges of course it was the overseas highway which was built on the, uh, the original railroad bridge that Flagler had built that had been wiped out I think in the 19 uh, 1925 I think hurricane but they built the highway and that was the only cement bridge I remember going to Key West the rest of them were just wooden bridges and Key West was just a small fishing village uh, they they uh, they fished for shrimp sea turtles and they uh, dove for sponges and there were you know that was the industry it was I think one street was paved and there was a fairly large uh, Navy base and a Marine base there. And, uh, and you said you went, went for sonar school. Did you get to choose that, or is that what the Navy said you were going to learn? That's, that's where I was placed. They, they probably did it through a series of, uh, you know, they, in this 14 days of training, they, they evaluated, you know, the individuals, and this is how they placed people. So what was training like at, at uh, Key West? How long were you there? Probably, uh, probably three weeks. It, it was great. The uniform today, of course, was the uh, was the uh, white uh, trousers and just with the uh, the t-shirt, no jumper. Uh, you know, the weather was gorgeous. Uh, but I had never been to see before except on a maybe crossing a ferry on Long Island Sound and uh, the Navy had confiscated a, lo a lot of the larger yachts private yachts and they used they installed the sonar equipment on these yachts and this is what we use uh, for training some of the time and uh, down below in those in the inside the hull where the sonar equipment was it was hot and you had these old chiefs and other rated people I mean they didn't they didn't have any mercy for their young sailors and I can remember uh, you know sitting on a stool turning that wheel and you know listening on the sonar and you get seasick and they had a bucket right there and you didn't get off the stool <laughs> and then uh, we would out and do that with like three other ships and uh, out, we were using a live submarine uh, they were uh, French subs they, some of the French subs had uh, uh, come to our side and they stationed them in, in Key West, and they weren't in a, in a war zone. And they were used for training purposes, the same way with Italian subs. And uh, we operated three ships with one sub. We, we'd have leave like 4.30 in the morning. I can remember waiting on those. The docks were wet from the dew, and all you could smell was the diesel fuel from you know the, the ships early in the morning when it the atmosphere held with the smells down it was it was it was kind of tough anyhow we'd operate three ships and then it would take probably 45 minutes to an hour to make a run on a sub so you're out there just waiting around and uh, we would what do you mean by make a run on the sub and, well this was the training you know as as if you had picked up a real sub and you were going to drop, drop depth charges and so forth Oh, so this was like practice and you were on a ship and practicing to... Attack the submarine. And what we would do, of course, we didn't use depth charges or hedgehogs. What they would do, the uh, sonar equipment has a, 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 a telegraph key on it. And a depth charge pattern, uh, like on a destroyer, I think is uh, 13 depth charges. So on this, uh, this is, they're not all fired at the same time. They're fired at, at different intervals. So this, the center of the pattern in Key West 
when we practice with the sub, on the center of the pattern we would hold the telegraph key down and it would send out a long, you know, uh, dash. When the submarine heard that, they would release a bubble of air and we would throw over a die marker off the fantail of the ship and then everybody would look to see where the bubble of air came up. If it came up near the die marker, if it came up through the center of the die marker, that was a direct hit. And, you know, that's what we always tried for. And that was only for three weeks? Yeah, that was, in, that was pretty intensive. I mean, we even had classes, uh, you know, early evening some days. Where did you go after your training? Now in Key West? Went to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and was put in the uh, in the crew of for the George E. Davis. Uh, all these people came together, uh, and we lived in uh, World War One barracks at the naval base in Norfolk, and uh, the whole nucleus of the of the crew was together the officers, all the enlisted men, and every day you know, the sonarmen would go off to their training, the gunners would go off, everybody during the day would go on to their different training missions, and that lasted, I don't know, maybe a month or so, and then uh, we got on a troop train and went to Orange, Texas and picked up the George E. Davis. Virginia, is that the first time that you got placed with the crew that you were going to be serving with? Yes. Yeah. So that was the first time you met that group? Yep, first time. Now, did you stay with that crew for a while? Oh, that, right through the war. Oh, you stayed with that same group of men right through? So you must be of course, they came, you know, there were people like, you know, for medical reasons, uh, for other reasons, came, you know, were left the ship and the replacements came on board. It was, it was a constant, you know, revolving of, of personnel, but the majority of us stayed. Can you tell me something about the George E. Davis? What kind of a ship it was, how big it was? It was a destroyer escort. It was 306 feet long, had close to 200 men aboard. Uh, uh, they were designed uh, basically to attack submarines. The, uh, in the early part of the war, you know, the ships are being sunk within sight of the, of the United States. Uh, there's still, you know, uh, ships out there and, and subs that were sunk within sight of, of, uh, of land. So they decided to uh, build a ship that they could build quickly and would serve the purpose. So they built, I don't know, um, about 550 of these ships, and they would probably build one in three months. Uh, ours was a later model. The earlier, there were different uh, classes of them, but they were all basically the same. The early ones had three three-inch guns and had a high superstructure and I didn't find out until we had a reunion in Albany uh, a couple of years ago. The reason that they were so high was that the early ones were built as a Lend-Lease program and they were given to England. But the English captains wanted a flying bridge, so that meant another level because Lord Nelson had a flying bridge and every captain in the British Navy wanted to be another Lord Nelson and wanted a flying bridge. So these things were a little top heavy. Ours, we didn't have that flying bridge. We, had a, a, we were a lower silhouette and we had two five inch guns. And uh, seeing they built so many of these ships, they couldn't make them all exactly alike because they couldn't get the uh, suppliers that, you know, for the engines and boilers and so forth, uh, they couldn't make them fast enough. So some of them were uh, diesel powered, some of them were diesel electric, some were steam electric. Ours was 
but I say one of the later versions, and I think the, the nicest looking ones, uh, we were a Westinghouse geared turbine, and we had a top speed of about 24 and a half knots, which was uh, pretty good. So, as I say, these where a destroyer could do almost 30 knots, we were, we didn't have the, uh, the destroyer has four boilers where we only had two because we were designed for convoy duty, which is very slow. But uh, I, I look back in the log and we were just a, a, a floating bomb. We had, I'm going to read what the ammunition that we loaded the first time. 1,394 rounds of 5 inch 38, 17,718 rounds of 40 millimeter, 60,660 rounds of 20 millimeter, three torpedoes, 25 hand grenades, 100 depth charges, and 412 hedgehogs. What's a hedgehog? Hedgehog, they were uh, a forward thrown projectile. They were. Uh, they carried about 25 pounds of, of a high explosive. They looked similar to a rocket, and they were placed uh, uh, behind the uh, forward five-inch gun. They were pins, and these projectiles were slid down over these pins. And the advantage was for the hedgehog, it didn't go off unless it hit something, plus the fact that you could train them a few degrees either to the right or to the left because when you attack the submarine of course the submarine knows exactly what you're doing that means that they can hear they can hear your screws they can hear your sonar they can tell the interval of the sonar when it's getting shorter that you're getting closer and so forth so at the last moment they try to do an evasive maneuver with the hedgehogs you could pick up that if you picked up that evasive maneuver you could train those hedgehogs a few degrees and there were 48 of them to a pattern and they went out over the bow of the ship and down and as I say if they hit then they would explode where a depth charge was you would set the depth charge for uh, the depth that you thought the sub was at and there was a variation in that 13 charge pattern uh, in depth so you were kind of guessing where it was but when they reached that depth, they exploded. And now when you would have an explosion like that in the water, you have a lot of turbulence, a lot of air, you could no longer echo range. You, you could echo range, but you're getting all these echoes from the turbulence in the water. Where the hedgehog, if nothing happened, you were still echo ranging, which was, was good. And we uh, we did that. Uh, we had a shakedown cruise in the in Bermuda, and there we used an Italian sub. And uh, we would come back into Bermuda late in the afternoon, and uh, we would escort the sub in. Of course, we'd all enter together, and you had to go through a submarine net. And one day, the Italian sub sent over and a and a or they they sent a signal that they had a hedgehog and we sent our whale boat over and the crew had scratched their names on it was a dummy with plastered fill but it when they surfaced it was on their cunning tower so it was a direct hit <laughs> and the crew had scratched their name on it and uh, we had it in the, in a, it's, it stood in the wardroom which was the officers you know, quarters mess. Where did you go after the shakedown cruise? Well, we went back to Norfolk. Of course, before we went to Bruna, we went to Galveston, we went in dry dock, and they painted the bottom and so forth. Uh, Bermuda, back to Norfolk. And then uh, we were issued cold weather clothing because we. We thought, you know, that indicated we're going to North Atlantic, Europe. And we went to the Boston Navy Yard for some minor repairs and so forth. And back to Norfolk. And then we had a, a captain's inspection on a Saturday. The captain had the crew form 
back on the fantail of the ship after the inspection and said, uh, this is Saturday afternoon. He said, you can call home, and he said, you can tell them, can't tell them where we're going, but you can tell them you're not going to see any uh, electric lights for a long time. The following day, trucks came alongside on the dock, and they took all the cold-weather cold clothing away. I still have my hat. I use it uh, when I go out with a snowblower. And uh, uh, I had my jacket. They, they let us keep that with the pants and so forth. They, they took all of, took the mittens and the face mask, all that went. And, uh, Why? What did that mean? You weren't going to the North Atlantic anymore? Right. <laughs> did they just change plans, or was that just to throw you off? No, no. What had happened, you see, this was, uh, I think this was uh, September 45, October, uh, and the Philippines had been in invaded. Now, the Philippines were invaded earlier than what they, the original plan was. They were, you know, there was an invasion plan, but uh, they had received some information that uh, in uh, in Lady Gulf, that the Japanese were uh, were not uh, did not have many troops there. So MacArthur said, "This is we're going to move the invasion date up." So which they did. So they needed some extra ships out there. So we were one of them, and we were six DEs in our division, Division 82. And we sailed from Norfolk to the Southwest Pacific. We went from Norfolk, we went down past Cuba, which is in the log. We could sight Cuba like 40 miles away, through the Panama Canal. We went uh, through the Panama Canal in the locks, two ships abreast. And that was quite an experience. Uh, I was the, the uh, a ship has what they call there's different uh, watches, and they have what they call a special sea detail, which is set whenever you're entering or leaving a port. You know, it, it rearranges the crew to do different duties. And my duty was I was the captain's bridge talker, so I stood next to the captain all the time because if he, I was an I had. <clears throat> phone talkers at the, uh, at the uh, up on the forecastle, the fantail, the two engine rooms, the two fire rooms, and damage control, and uh, the uh, CIA, which was uh, where the radar was. So I was, a t I could talk to these different people to, to uh, transmit any instructions that the captain had. That was, a, you know, the means of communication. And these were sound-powered phones. There no electricity involved. And, uh, of course, that was that made it very interesting because I was next to the captain. And any time you enter a port, uh, you, most of the time, you take on a pilot, a local pilot. And of course, to go through the Panama Canal, we had a pilot. And I'm standing there, we're going through the canal, and he's pointing out all these different things. It was, you know, very interesting. And we got on the uh, Pacific side of the canal late in the afternoon, and it was quite windy, and the, the pilot was still in charge. And uh, we were tied up a, a, alongside uh, other ships that were tied to a, a pier, and we hit one of them pretty hard. I mean, the wind caught the ship. You know, it was 306 feet long. There's, there's a lot of wind resistance. Anyhow... Around the pan this is like five o'clock in the afternoon. So the captain, we uh, the cap we had a good captain. He was a uh, he was a good guy. Do you remember his name? Oh yeah, Frederick I. Lincoln. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's he even came here and stayed overnight with us, uh, and we're still in touch with his son. Uh, we had a, it was a good crew. You know, he was an exceptional person. Anyhow, he wanted the full crew to go ashore, so you can't you can't abandon the ship. So we had, the ship was generally divided up into three crews. 
so that you could stand a four-hour watch, then you would have eight hours off, four on, eight off, and then every two weeks or so you would you would change, you know, it would uh, revolve because you would have like uh, four to eight in the morning, and then you'd have the four to eight in the evening, and they would revolve anyhow. For Panama, he split it up into two groups. So he gave the first group two hours ashore, and then I was in the second group, and we went ashore for two hours. I know we came back like at nine, ten o'clock at night. Well, by this time, you know, being in the tropics, that everybody had been drinking. I mean, it was it was kind of scary. I mean, they almost had to turn the fire roses on the, in, in one compartment. It was almost with the fights going on, and you know, everybody was. They were drunk, you know, practically the whole crew. Anyhow, we left the next morning, and we went to uh, uh, the Galapagos Islands for fuel. And uh, what the Galapagos Islands looked like was nothing. It was just like a rock and sticking out of the water, and they had these huge round buoys floating out there and the oil tanks were up on the shore and you tied up to this buoy and then you got your fuel well part of uh, my second job on the ship I was a movie operator and uh, my friend Jim Ferris who was a sonarman who was from Hartford as I said the captain wanted to take care of his crew so Movies and mail were always a very important thing. So Jim and I were the only two from that whole crew that got ashore in the Galapagos Islands, and we went ashore. And there was a there was a a, a ramp uh, in the coming out of the water, and there's a PBY sitting on the ramp, and up behind it, uh, on a little knoll, were uh, a few Quonset huts, and that was the post office. So we went in and traded the, the movies. In those days, the, the movies were the regular 35-millimeter movies like they used in the theater, just like three, four reels to a movie, and they're heavy. You know, you know we carried them in a sea bag, had to carry them on your shoulder because you, you, you had to trade your movies. Anyhow, we traded the movies and got the mail, and the fellow said to us, Hey, would you like to see some of the uh, wildlife here? Yeah, we said, Sure. He said, go out back. He said, look in the cages. Of course, we went up and we looked, and they had all these, you know, lizards and so forth in, in these cages that are natives of Galapagos Islands. But so I said, we were the only two that went ashore, and we left uh, the Galapagos Islands. I think we went to next to Espirito Santos for fuel, and then past the Solomon Islands. Uh, and we came into Olandia, New Guinea, and that was the day we entered, probably around noontime. My God, it was amazing. It's a large, deep water harbor with mountains that come right down to the water. And I counted approximately 300 cargo ships in that harbor. This was the, this was the jumping off point, you see, for the Philippines, because the Phil Philippines have already been, you know, the the war was going on there now, but this was where the, all the supplies are coming from. It was from Olandia. And I remember over on one side, there was a, a road that came down, and there was a pier, and the hospital ship would, was uh, tied up. And you could see the road was just a, a solid uh, line of ambulances coming down to the hospital ship. Because you see, the battle in New Guinea was uh, it was a tough battle. They went over the the high mountains. I mean, the Japanese never thought that we could do it, but we did it. But it was uh, there were a lot of casualties, and the dust from that road it would drift out over the water, over this huge bay. I mean, and the ship you would have you would you could rub your hand and you could get the, the red dust. And then you get an afternoon shower and return the mud and so forth. But that was New Guinea, and we we left New Guinea. It took a 
a, a convoy of ships up to uh, to Lady and so forth, and we we did that uh, many times. I think we crossed. Uh, we did about 13 trips. You know, we we'd go across the equator every time. The first time we went across the equator, was, you know, I think, was right after the Galapagos Islands or before. Of course, that's a big ceremony in the Navy. For the first time you go over, you're called a a, a, a polywog, and then after you cross, you're a shellback. But there's this initiation that goes on when you cross the equator, and I have pictures of it. You know, and it was, it was, uh, you know, it was a you fun were thing. You initiated the first time. What happened each time you go up over it after that? Uh, nothing happened. I mean, you know, it was just the first time that was it. So then we, you know, we spent a lot of time in the Philippines. We ended. We went to Okinawa. We, you know. We'd go to all these different places, but we're always escorting ships and so forth. Uh, so was your regular duty then to go from New Guinea to Leyte, back to New Guinea, and then escort? Yeah, years? that was, uh, we did that for quite a while, you know. For how long? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to, you know. Months or years? What year, what, what, like what year are you in now? We're, uh, we're in 45. Do you remember what month you were over there? Oh, I don't know. No, I'd have to look it up, but it's, uh, and, uh, you know, we had a lot of experiences there. Uh, Do you recall any memorable experiences? Yeah, we went, we had a con. we had a convoy, and, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, we were taking some uh, dry dock, an army dry dock, to Formosa, and we went. We ran into a hurricane, a typhoon, as they call it, in that uh, part of the world. And the uh, the dry dock was actually going backwards for about a day. I mean, they couldn't. They could just hold it into the wind, and that was about it. And that was that was quite an experience. Another time, one of the convoys from New Guinea. To uh, Lady, uh, there was a LCT. LCT is a uh, landing sh uh, landing craft tank. They could carry, I think, about five tanks on those, and they were open deck. And it was under tow by a merchant ship, and they had some big army trucks on board. And the army had loaded it in uh, in Hollandia, but apparently the uh, the army didn't know exactly what they were doing. And one of the trucks, we you know, it was rough weather, and one of the trucks broke loose and landed up on the uh, the rail of the ship. So it threw it off balance, and the ship was, the LCT was listing. Uh, and this, that the tow broke, and this was about 7 o'clock at night. It was, it was dark, it was windy, it was rainy, and we went alongside to see if we could help, because uh, our duty had been to, we had to drop out of the convoy, to stay with this LCT. Well, it looked pretty hopeless. The crew came aboard. I think the captain and the, uh, the first mate stayed stayed on the LCT that night, and then we we had to uh, let them go at night because they were it was so rough and they were bouncing up alongside the ship and they they would have stove the side of our ship and you know they, they were. They were probably uh, 150 feet, 200 feet long. They were a fairly large uh, landing craft. So we sent the repair party we did, uh, back over in the morning, and boarding party, and uh, took off the other two men. And uh, it, it was uh, we couldn't save it. So the crew, it was a five-member crew, came aboard our ship, and uh, we sunk it with gunfire. And it 
took us about a day to catch back up to our position in the convoy. And it so happens that we stayed in touch. Well, yeah, I say stay in touch. It was about a maybe a 30-year period where we would maybe receive a few Christmas cards from some of the one crew members that we were close to. But there was this fellow by the name of John Triplett. He was a radio man, and he lived in Louisville. And he got, we had an original uh, mailing list when we were on the ship in the war. And he went through that list and called people. And anyhow, he organized the first reunion, I think it was, I don't have to ask Emily, but it was in the late 80s. And that was quite an experience. And at one of the other, re then we had a reunion most every year. And you know, at one of the reunions, the the captain of this LCT, and he was just an ensign, and I know he may have been 25 years old. And his mate at one of the reun at that reunion, uh, Bill Mosley. Bill got up during the course of the meeting uh, at the reunion and said. I have something to present to uh, Gary Cox. <coughs> I have trouble with it today. It was the uh, ensign, the American flag from the LCT that was all weathered, torn, and presented it to him. It was on a dry eye in the, in, the, in the place. He still had it. So Bill, Bill's wife, uh, or Gary's wife, had it framed and gave it to him for a um, you know, birthday present or something. It's mounted in their living room. But uh, they were the part of that five-member crew that we took off that night uh, in that howling storm. And that, you know, there are many other experiences similar. Well, how long did that crew stay with you? Because well, until the, the end of the ocean, so there was no place to go. Oh wow, well, there were there was there were means of uh, of transportation. I mean, there were ships going back all the time. Uh, you know, as I said, we had people coming on and going off all the time. Uh, we would uh, we would I looked through the uh, logs and we would carry you know 50 mail bags or something to take to somewhere in there so that you know there was a lot of transportation going on of course the war came to an end everybody had points so the fellows that had been in the longest left the ship and uh, you know uh, a lot of the crew members change, but do you have any other memorable experiences when you were doing your escort duty? Yeah, we were. We took. We were taking this troop ship into uh, Nagasaki, and uh, they were still in Japan. Yeah, and they were still sweeping the harbor for mines. They had these mine sweepers out there that. Uh, Told these underwater cutters and to cut the mines free, and uh, we had special sea details set. And of course, everybody was on the bridge. That's where I was. That's where the sonar equipment was, right up on the bridge. And everybody is looking for mines. All of a sudden, there's this mine, and we're heading right for it. The quartermaster. Uh, Whitey Wooten ran into the pilot house and grabbed the wheel out of the uh, the helmsman and did a right hand turn. The captain, I mean, he did it so quick the captain hadn't even given the order yet, and he turned the ship. And of course, we missed the mine, but that was that was an experience. So we got in with the troop ship. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon, 
and we couldn't stay. We brought the troop ship in as, as close as we could, and we had to turn around and get out before uh, nightfall because of the danger of the mines and so forth in the water. And that was, uh, that was one of the things I remember. Did you see combat while you were overseas? Uh, while we were in Lady, uh, of course, the Japanese were, uh, planes were coming in. It was all clear. Uh, it was cold red. It was cold white, which was the all clear. Uh, and these planes are coming in when they were all, uh, suicides were coming in when it was all clear even. They were coming in underneath radar. Uh, we were fueling one day uh, alongside a tank. It was, it was uh, close. Well, it was around noontime. And uh, seeing I was on special sea detail, I had uh, went through the mess line first with you know the other people, and we were sitting on deck. There was a bench up against the side of the ship, and sitting on the bench with some other fellows. And all of a sudden, the suicide plane came down, and Hit the sh uh, hit a tanker. Went through the deck of the tanker and came out at the water line. And the, uh, the tanker apparently was empty or whatever. There was no explosion or anything. But that was in all clear. <laughs> Did you see that happen? Oh yeah, That's sitting right there. Uh, yeah, we you know we quickly got away from that tanker. We didn't finish fueling or anything. Uh, and then we had a convoy, I think it was New Year's Day, uh, 1940, 45, 44. And uh, late in the afternoon, this Japanese plane came, uh, a Betty, which is a two-engine two bomber, uh, and we went, had general quarters, of course, and we shot at it. It went out of sight and it came back. It uh, tried to uh, first uh, torpedo one of the ships and it, it missed. And then it came back and it tried to bomb one of the ships and we shot it down with a five inch. See, going back to the original part, the, why our ship had uh, had the five inch guns and the other, the older models had the three inch guns. Uh, I think it was about 1944 or so. It was a big improvement uh, in anti-aircraft uh, firing. The five, they developed a five-inch shell that they called a close proximity. It had a close, close proximity fuse. In other words, as it, you shot at an airplane, as soon as it got close to it and it started to go away it would explode didn't have to hit it it would explode it had a radio in it you see in this five inch shell now the day we got those shells we had loaded all this other ammunition I talked about we're in Orange Texas and Orange Texas was a rickety old dock I mean the, the some of the boards were missing I mean it was a disaster well like nine o'clock in the morning, this trailer truck comes in, and all these Marine guards, and they stood there. They formed a corridor, while we took that ammunition from that truck and loaded it on the ship, and that was the special proximity fuses shells, because it was highly secretive that we had developed such a you know a shell. And that was the advantage of using the five-inch gun. The three, they didn't have any for three-inch guns, so the five-inch gun became very effective any aircraft device. Now that was in late day, also the New Year's Day incident. Uh, I, 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 I don't know where, it, uh, where it would, what time it, where the location was. Were there any casualties in your unit? Well, we had. There were. Con you look, look through the log. You'll see constant injuries. Uh, 
minor injuries. Uh, you got 200 men, things, things happen, people hit their heads, people slip and fall. Uh, we did have one, er, we had no combat injuries. Uh, the forward five inch gun, on every watch, they would do a, uh, they were called ready guns, they were manned all the time. But in that four hour period, they would go through a drill. And this happened like five o'clock in the morning. They were going through their drill. And when they depress that five inch gun, the, the end of it goes into a depression in the, in the deck. And somehow or other, when, when they fire it, there's what they call a hot shellman. He wears big asbestos gloves and an apron, and he has to catch that shell when it comes out of the back end of that gun, and he drops it through a hatch and it falls on the deck. Well, somehow or other, he got his foot caught when they depressed that gun, and he had a serious injury. And we, we only had <clears throat> one doctor for six ships. We had chief pharmacist mate and lesser pharmacist mate, and they were like, they were like doctors. I mean, but they had to transfer this. As soon as we got to port, we had to transfer this person uh, to the ship that had the doctor. And, and you know, I through the reunions been in touch with him, and uh, he never fully recovered. He said it bothered it bothered him all his life, and uh, I think he's still alive. Now, when you were on board in your job with Sonar Man, was that all you did was to operate the Sonar, or did you have other duties also? Well, the movie operator. That the was, movie operator? Yeah. Of course, we'd get the port, you know, and uh, we had a, a screen we'd put up on the fan tail, and we'd show the movies, or if we were at sea, uh, and it wasn't too rough, we'd show the movies in the mess hall. Now, as a sonar man, what was your job like, and where did you in like a little room on a certain deck? Like a little clo little closet up on the bridge, because you had to be in close. Because if we picked up a sonar contact, you know that, that was, was the officer who directed the ship, and we called out the ranges and so forth, and locations and the bearings and. So it had to be uh, on the bridge where we're in uh, direct contact. Now, is there just one sonar man on duty at a time? No, there were three of us. So three of you fit in that little room? No, one man on the on the on the sonar equipment, one man on the helm, and one man standby. And every I think it was every fifteen twenty minutes we were. Uh, revolve because you only could listen to that sound for so long you see and what would your watch typically be the four hours on and eight hours off yes yeah so then a new crew would come in and you would be here. yeah every four hours should be you know at the end of your four hours you're relieved now after you did the escort duty between New Guinea and the Philippines where did your ship go well, we we went to many many places. Uh, went to the Admiralty Islands. We took uh, damaged ships, you know, back to back of uh, you know more remote secure areas for repairs and so forth it, it, we you could do many things we uh, we operate out of Subic Bay for a while uh, and Subic Bay was a, a deep water port it's uh, I think it's north of, of Manila uh, it's a small harbor but very deep and there, there was a, a, a submarine tender there and this, this was the end of the run. That the subs would do a run from Subic Bay down the China coast. I think they would go to Australia, and then they would come back, and that was a whole run. And we would 
train with these subs and we would also go out and wait for them to come back from their run because as they got close to the Philippines they had to surface and they were afraid to surface unless they had an escort because at this time it was near the end of the war and we had many airplanes and the pilots were getting a little you know happy with their guns and they were afraid that they would sink one of our subs so we would go out and their coordinates in the ocean and we knew the coordinate where the sub was supposed to be and we would use our sonar uh, our telegraph key to send out the code. The code would change every four hours. Uh, it was a, a four-letter code and we would transmit that and the sub would hear us and we would make contact with them and they would surface and then we would escort them all the way in. Uh, one time we uh, one of them surfaced and they tied the broom on the cunning tower which meant they had a clean sweep every tor they, they sunk a ship with every torpedo that was unusual other times we waited the broom? Huh? what did they tie on the cunning tower? broom oh. Clean, oh, I get it. clean sweep clean sweep that was a navy tradition uh, other times we wait and no one came uh, and I spent a day aboard a, a sub out of Subic for training and that was an experience also I mean I was a you know we uh, I think there were three of us that we exchanged three of us and three submariners you know we changed to see what it was like and uh, I was on the sub and they did you know they were going to dive well the klaxon goes off and it somebody on a microphone yelled dive 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 and these sailors come sliding down the ladders out of the cunning tower my god it was uh, amazing the way things just snapped too and up in the forward torpedo room this this sub had a big tank behind the cunning tower inside there was this suppose we never saw it of course it was a big rubber boat and down in the forward torpedo room there were these three Australian officers and they were demolition experts and we watched them they had their canvas rolls with all these detonators and bombs and so forth and they rolled it all out on the deck and they would check each one and rolled it back up and one of the, the you know talking to the crew members because these they didn't they weren't too friendly the Australians but the crew members told us that they would go through this ritual of checking their munitions every day and what they would do they would put them ashore these off in, off the coast of China they would come in close enough to shore and they at night and they were in their rubber boat would go ashore and they were blowing up railroads and so forth and then they would pick them back up on a, a rendezvous and take them back and that's what was going on. Were you awarded any medals or citations? No, just they uh, got a, a battle star for the, the Philippines. questions now about daily life. How did you stay in touch with family? Oh, uh, through emails. Through what? Emails. No, not emails. A uh, V-mail. <laughs> V-mail. What's a V-mail? Well, you write a letter on a piece of paper and they photograph it and they shrink it up so it's just a little thing and it's sent to New York that was the where the uh, the fleet post office was or like one on each coast anyhow and there they blow it back up and I have some and uh, you know when it gets home it's, it's measures maybe five by six inches or so your letter yeah did you get regular mail service 
Oh, yeah. But uh, when we first went out there, the mail was tough. When we went, uh, we went like three months, maybe four months without mail in the beginning. Because, you know, the, uh, the invasion of the battle was still going on in, in, in Luzon. Uh, Jim Ferris and I, we went ashore the first time when that first convoy into Lady. And uh, there was a small pier, and they, there was a tower, and there was a person up in this tower with a bullhorn directing. There were like probably 50 whale boats and other landing craft circling, waiting to come into that pier. And this, the harbor director was directing them, you know, which boat to come in. So we finally got in, and we walked to the post office. And it was, it was. I remember the street was very muddy, and there were planks, and of course the Philippine houses were all around. And here's this Quonset Hut post office, and we go in, and uh, they didn't have any movies yet to trade. So here we are carrying the movies, and we can't trade it. Yeah, tack open, and we asked for mail and told him that Georgie Davis and everything, go out back, go out back and, and look, it's all alphabetical. And Jim and I go out there and there's these rows of, of canvas mail bags out in a tropical atmosphere where it rains every day. And we finally found like five bags of mail in our section and we dragged those things back to the dock. We had to make a couple trips. We got back aboard ship with the mail. I mean, this 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 was an all-day thing just to get the whale boat back into the pier so we can get in it because there were so many ships out there. We get the, the mail back and they open the mail and Jim, you know, it was read letter by letter. The, some of it if you could find an address, you were lucky. I mean, it was so rotten. I mean, it had been out in that rain and heat. I mean, who knows how long or where it came from. I mean, but that was that was one bad experience about the mail that, that time. But after that, it got better, though. All right, Jim, we're going to take a break right now so I can change the tape. All right. Right, Norm, we left off, uh, you told me about V-mail, and I know you have some examples of it, of actual V-mails you had sent home. What was the food like on board ship? It was, uh, it was all right, but we didn't have uh, too much uh, fresh food. Uh, at one time, we... You know, we didn't have uh, limited refrigeration. There's no air conditioning uh, on those on those ships, and you know, at that time, today everything is air conditioned. Uh, we could store potatoes probably for three weeks at the most, and then they would just rot. You know, to throw them overboard. So we had powdered potatoes, and. Uh, they weren't refined like they are today. I mean, you know, today, I mean, they're almost as good as the real thing. But back then, they were sort of grainy. And uh, we, at one time, took on a lot of uh, uh, Australian or New Zealand, one of them, uh, lamb. But uh, it, it, we ended up, we met up with a, a refrigerator ship and we got some f fresh American beef and at at night when it got dark we threw overboard <laughs> the oh, New wow. Zealand lamb because it was almost uh, non you know, couldn't didn't have a flavor it was bad so as I say uh, f fresh was uh, was hard to come by uh, when we did take, we took, there was a, uh, a sub, English sub that had an electrical fire on board. There was a PC, and there was, a, you know, a destroyer that had been hit, 
or one smokestack missing. And we took them back to, Esp I know, back in the Admiralty Islands. And that was a, that was one of the supply areas. My God. And we got fresh food there. We had uh, a working party, which I was part of, to go ashore. And uh, the frozen meat came in, in boxes, maybe two feet long, eight inches deep. 16 inches wide or so, probably 50 pounds to a box. And they had these portable freezers. My God, they were lined up. So, and, and, and you would go with a, uh, a storekeeper, and you, had, you know, they, they, get, they had our shopping list, and they would unlock the door, and you'd take out so many cases. I don't know, he turned his back or something and somebody handed me a case and said, Too much on the truck. So the truck starts moving and I running after the truck and I finally got it up there. It was a case of liver. <laughs> <laughs> because we did they did serve liver quite a quite a bit and so forth. But uh, we did have ice cream. Our, our executive officer, uh, Fred Vance, who wrote that letter on censorship, had been on a four-piper uh, in the early part of the war in the Pacific. Oh, four-pipers, an old War One destroyer. I mean, we were desperate at that point. We are anything that floated. And when he found out he was going to be the executive officer on the destroyer escort, they're going to have, we're going to have an ice cream machine, he said. So he went, when we were in Norfolk, I don't know how he did it. He was a wheeler dealer, but somebody owed him some favor somewhere. So anyhow, he got us an ice cream machine. So we did have ice cream. But there again, uh, like the potatoes, it was powdered milk, and it was grainy, but it was cold, and it was better than nothing. And I remember uh, one time we had a tie up to uh, the dock in Alandia, and these army guys found out we had ice cream. Well, boy, there was a line out there. I mean, <laughs> we gave them ice cream. And even when we were in uh, uh, Okinawa, uh, at night the PT boats would tie up alongside. They'd come aboard and take a shower and get some food and so forth because. They were living, you know, under worse conditions than what we were. By now, you, um, while we're talking about Okinawa, I know off camera you told me that you were have been in Okinawa and China also. What was your duty when you were in Okinawa? Well, as I said, we were on that picket line, which was a line of ships offshore to intercept the uh, suicide planes coming in. And... Uh, they were coming in. I mean, the, our radar wasn't picking them up. And at night, we would have to lay a smoke screen down uh, to try to conceal the ships on the picket line. And we had that capability of uh, destroyer and, and DEs. There was a smoke-making machine on the fantail of the ship that made this white smoke. And we had that capability. And that was... Uh, you walked around looking up in the air. Anytime you were topside, you were looking up in the air because, and we had the guns were manned 24 hours a day uh, because you never knew. It could be all clear, and they were coming in. And the suicide planes were, would hit, they would try to hit the superstructure of the ship. Our, in fact, our first trip on that into Lady on that uh, with that convoy, early in the morning at daybreak, we passed the uh, cruiser. I think it was in Nashville, going out to sea, and they were on their way to Mindanao for the invasion. Well, we got in with the convoy, and about nine, uh, probably nine ten o'clock in the morning or so, they came back in with a smokestack missing. And they anchored to us nearby, and a, uh, a large landing craft came alongside, and we saw them passing over the, the dead to the landing craft. They had taken a suicide 
you know, within a, a few hours, an hour or so after we saw them. In fact, that was in the paper just very recently, uh, maybe like three weeks ago. It was the anniversary of that happening. Supplies, the ammunition, and other items that you needed on board. Yeah, we. Uh, I will say that mechanically, the, the those ships are well equipped. I mean, we were self-sufficient. We had many uh, boxes, steel boxes with spare parts, uh, so you could almost take care of anything that wasn't major. Now, you were young, you were kids. I mean, take everything in stride. Uh, the older men, older, 25 years old, anybody was, I don't think we had anybody close to 30, but some of them were married and they were under stress. But uh, the young kids like us, there was no stress. Was there anything that you did special for good luck? For good luck? No. No. What did you do for entertainment? Now I know you said that you had movies. So you would, you would trade movies wherever you went and you'd have movies on board ships and we know that was one of your jobs. Right. What else did you do for entertainment? Well, we did go ashore. We did have beer on the ship, but we couldn't drink on the ship. The commission ship, you cannot drink. But we did have beer, so when we went ashore for liberty, they would send over beer. You would have three bottles of beer or something per man. Uh, I can remember on one of the islands, and uh, we're, it was a Dutch island because they had coconut palms. I mean, there were rows of them. There was, it was a plantation sort of thing. Uh, and you could not damage the trees because you were be fined by the Dutch government. But we sat on the beach, I remember that, and we had a beer party, and you can go swimming. They, uh, a couple of the gunner's mates uh, came over, and they had uh, carbines in case there were sharks and so forth. Uh, and then, of course, Manila was a, was a place of liberty. We went ashore a lot in Manila. And then on some of the other islands, never did. Did you see any USO shows? Yeah, one. We had a swim. <laughs> did you swim to see it? Where was it? It was in New Guinea, and they uh, they sent flyers out on it. So I don't know. Some of us decided we'd go. It was a, it was probably like six o'clock, seven o'clock at night. It was dark, and we're on this. Uh, this motor launch it's probably 60, 80 feet long with all these sailors on board going into shore where there was a, an amphitheater well the coxswain he ran the thing aground <laughs> we had to wade in up to our waist in the water and sit there and saw the show and I don't remember what this, the show was good or not but I remember it, we got pretty cold sitting there with wet bottoms watching this this how show. Did you get back your ship I don't. I don't remember. I don't remember how we got back. Did you have any other leave, or just the short periods of shore leave um, when you were overseas? Just liberties. That's all. There was no leave. Oh, so it's just like what twenty-four hour liberty. Oh no! Oh no! No, just. No, you, you probably four or five hours or so. That's it. Oh. Did you travel anywhere and see any other places while you were in the service? Doesn't sound like you had much time. Just no, were no. We, of course, we went ashore in China. We spent, we, you know, we spent I think three months in China. Really? What part of China? Uh, Tsingtao, China. It's up in the north. And, 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 of course, we did uh, Shanghai too. We spent time in Shanghai. We did Liberty in Shanghai and so forth. And what was your duty while you were the three months in China? 
Well, we steamed up and down the coast for support of the uh, Nationalist Army, as it says on the uh, on the statement of our mission statement. Uh, and uh, we did have, you know, numerous liberties. Uh, Sing Tao, I remember on Sundays we used to go horseback riding. I have pictures of that. When we entered Shanghai the first time, that was uh, that was an experience in itself. Also, uh, of course, we had the pilot on board, and uh, we got in Shanghai on the Wang Pu, and you you tie up the buoys, you know, tie to a pier, and all the ships were lined up in this river. And I remember there was one English ship, and they were lit from stem to stern with lights. I mean, the rest of us were they were dark. But anyhow, uh, as soon as we came in, the, uh, the Chinese junks came out, and uh, they had boat hooks, and they were grabbing the deck, and they wanted food. So we emptied our garbage cans into their boats, and they had number 10 cans that they had punched holes in the bottom to act as a sieve. And they took that garbage and they washed it in that Wang Pu River, which is so brown and so dirty that you can't, you know, there's no visibility through it. It's so, it's so muddy. And they were washing that garbage out in that, in that river for food. I mean, you know, they were desperate. This was the end of the war. Any particularly humorous or unusual events? Well, uh, we had a ship's party in Manila, and uh, Walter Gabe is the cook I described to you earlier by coming back as a private cook for the captain on a, a repair ship. Uh, he had missed, he had been. Uh, late getting back to the ship from Liberty, and he ended up at Captain's Mass. Now, Captain's Mass is is like a uh, a minor court, and it was held by the mass of the ship on the on the torpedo deck, and the captain and the and a, another officer and a, and a yeoman to, to record everything would stand on one side. And on the other row was the accused person, and so forth. Well, Wally Gabers got restricted to the ship, I don't know, for whatever it was. It's in the log. Well, when we had the party, the captain felt sorry that Wally was restricted to the ship, so he made him part of the, uh, re, uh, the, uh, the uh, committee for the party so he could go ashore. <laughs> As I say, we had an exceptional captain. What did you think of officers and fellow seamen? We had we had a good crew. We had a very good crew. Still in contact with uh, one of the officers, well, a number of them. A fellow by the name of Frank Hanawalt, and I think he ended up as a superintendent of schools in Seattle. And what was he on ship? Uh, I I think he was communication officer, but he came from one of the the other ships. Uh, we had uh, a commodore who was head of the six ships, and he was on the uh, the uh, D E Mac. And this is the story that Frank Hanawalt tells. Uh, it probably was uh, uh, Christmas of 45 or so. Anyhow, the captain in the wardroom uh, announced that, uh, you know, if you wanted to stop by later, uh, I'm going to have a, a few bottles out and you can, you can help yourself. Well, there's no, not supposed to be any drinking, even the officers. So Frank being so straight like an arrow, said, Captain, how about the enlisted men? If we can drink, why can't they? Well, shortly thereafter, he was transferred to our ship. 
And he tells the story. He said as soon as he came aboard our ship, he could feel the difference in the crew and the officers. I mean that, you know, it was night and day between the two ships. And uh, as I said, uh, we still got a Christmas card from Frank. Uh, his wife passed away a few years ago, and she was a uh, she taught in a in a in a college. She was a professor in a college, and they were just wonderful, down to earth people. Did you keep a personal diary or a journal? You weren't supposed to. I did keep a little, tiny little book with with dates in it. Uh, you weren't supposed to keep any any journals. That was uh, against regulations. Where were you when the war ended? We're at sea somewhere. Do you remember the reaction of the crew when you heard? Yeah, yeah. Well, it was yeah, everybody was elated. Of course, you know we had. Uh, we had the news of the dropping of the bombs and so forth. See, being up on the bridge, we used to get the... They would send a hard copy from the uh, radio room up there, and, and you know, they would... It, they were tracking the war in Europe and so forth, and we'd go up on the clipboard, and we would uh, we would read these messages. Where, so now, after China, did you go back to the United States? Yeah, we uh, we sailed back. Uh, we went to. Uh, we didn't go through the canal. We went up through the central. We went to uh, Honolulu, Pearl Harbor. We went through. An no, we stopped. We and we we stopped at Anawitok. And the ships are all getting all lined up for the dropping of the, of the bomb, the, at the, the atomic bomb on them the, that they had. Did you know it at the time? Oh, yes, yeah. And uh, as I said, we spent a few days, days in Pearl Harbor. And then we uh, went to uh, San Diego. Then they sent us up to uh, Los Angeles, and that's where we... I left the ship. Then I rode a troop train all the way back across the country to the East Coast. By yourself or? On a, no, on a troop train. With so other, all, all troops from all different branches? Right. Uh, it was all Navy, but I didn't know, you know any of them, of course. Now, were you discharged at that time? At Lido, Lido Beach, uh, Long Island. Oh, so after you took the troop train, you took it to Long Island? They discharged you from there and then mm -hmm. went home to Connecticut? Right. Do you recall your last day in service? No. I remember I got a few dollars to ride the train back to Hartford and <laughs> Bristol. Now, I know you also said that you served in the Korean War. Yeah. You were discharged from World War II, went home. How'd you get back in? Oh, I was still in the reserves, you see. So you stayed in the reserves. What were, at, as a reservist, what did you have to do? Well, I, I report to the reserve center in Hartford, and there was a uh, a PC on the uh, Connecticut River at a station in Middletown, and we took that one year. <coughs> uh, we went to uh, Nantucket. We went through the uh, Cape Cod Canal. What's a PC? It was about a hundred and fifty feet long or so. It was oh, a patrol so craft. PCs, yeah, and uh, we went to Nantucket. I remember went up to Halifax. <coughs> I was the navigator for that trip. <laughs> so you were still in the reserves when the Korean War. Yeah, I got called back. Got called back in 1951. I think I was discharged in '52 or something. So but you were called to active duty in yes. 1951. Yeah. In '53, I think I was discharged. Somewhere in there, I have the discharge paper. Now, what were your duties in the Korean War? Well, 
<coughs> went from I was in the Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard for maybe four or five days, and then I was transferred to Norfolk uh, to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and lived aboard a uh, destroyer repair ship and put a destroyer that was in mothballs back in commission. And that it was a it was a nightmare. There were a lot of regular navy, and they had no use for the reservists. I can remember we stood on that pier, and this old chief got on the microphone and said, "You reservists, just make up your mind. None of you are going to be home for Christmas this year." I mean, uh, stuff like that. Uh, and we put this these they put a number of these ships back into into service. And everything was a timetable, and uh, we weren't supposed to be aboard the ship. We couldn't do anything onto the the inboard side that faced the pier. Any work that was visible, we had to do it on the other side because of the timetable. It was it was a waste of time. The uh, all of, I mentioned earlier, we had you know self-sufficient with all these repair parts and boxes and you had open up these boxes where the tools and the parts are supposed to be they're completely empty and it would be written on the cover Kilroy was here I mean it, everything had been stolen so we finally got the ship back in commission it had uh, leaky boiler tubes uh, but uh, it ended up by going to Korea and I had at that time at, at that point, I had enough points that too many points that I would have gotten over there, and then I would have been discharged. So I I didn't go. The ship left, and I I was discharged. So, um, what did you do in the days and weeks after you got home from World War Two? Oh, I did. I did photography for a while. Then I uh, I became a plumber, and I worked at heavy construction. Uh, you go back to school at all in the GI? I, I, yeah, I did. I took uh, construction courses and so engineering courses. Where? At, at that time, it was uh, Hilliard College, which is part of the University of Hartford now. Uh, and I eventually became a facilities director for one of the large insurance companies in Hartford, and that's where I retired from. What company was that? Connecticut Mutual, part of Mass Mutual. It's Mass Mutual now, but uh, I was uh, in charge of that that whole building, which is you know half a million square feet or so. And I know you got married at some point. Yeah. 1955, been married for 51 years. And still live in Bristol, Connecticut. Yeah. Did you stay in touch with any of the uh, guys on your ship? Oh, yeah. As I said, uh, approximately 30, 40 years went by, and we finally got together, and we had a number of reunions. We had some very good reunions. Uh, you know, I have pictures to attest to that. And, and develop good friendships. Still have some. We Just in the month of March, we were in Florida and stopped by and saw an old friend, Stanley Cohen, and made phone calls to others. Still received Christmas cards. You know, we were a close-knit organization. Do you still have reunions? Yes. I don't know where it's going to be this year. Last year we didn't go to it. See, our, our, our ship uh, uh, served in the Korean War <clears throat> as well as put back in commission. So there were two crews, the World War II crew and the Korean crew. So we, we get together. But uh, like Emily said, uh, can tell you, uh, the feeling is different. I mean... Because it's both crews at the same time? No, no. It's the circumstances under which we serve. The wartime crew was a, is a lot closer-knit group. 
than the Koreans. The, the Korean War said that the uh, ship was used for training midshipmen. They would take Annapolis midshipmen on cruises. They went to South America and so forth during the Korean period. So they never saw combat as we did. And if, the, the feelings are different. I mean, we get along. We're, we get along fine and everything. But the, the feeling between that, you know, uh, the con, con, comradeship is not doesn't seem to be there between the two groups, in the difference in the groups, rather. Do you join any veterans' organizations? Long American Legion. Do you do any activities with them? No. Attend meetings once in a while, that's all. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Oh, yes. Yeah. How? Well, I, I've, I, I have a feeling that I think that all young people should serve some military time especially the generations we have today, it, it's discipline. When you're aboard a ship like that, if, if one person doesn't do his job, it's a, it's a threat to everyone else aboard that ship. I mean, you have to function as a unit, and it's discipline. I mean, you have to do things that you really don't care to do or may not have the interest in doing, but at that discipline and that's what you get in boot camp I mean I mean you know I can remember boot camp where you had to make your your bed every day and there couldn't be a wrinkle and the blanket had to be just so and your locker you had to roll all your clothing and use uh, strings to tie it and if anything wasn't proper Two, three o'clock in the morning, they would come, get you out of that bunk, and you'd run around that grinder two, three times as punishment for one person. Oh, you'd all have to go out there? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The whole barracks. So you, if someone wasn't towing the line, I can remember going back, and at the back end of the barracks, as I said, there was a the, the coal stove. And there were the, all the washboards. You had to, you know, you had to wash your own clothing and so forth. And then they had clotheslines, and you had to hang it up. And you, these little strings I, I, I talked about, they're called clothes ties. They're probably about eight inches long. They have a grommet at each end of the cord so they won't unravel. And you had to take your clothes, and you had to make a half hitch, like, you know, from sweater or your shorts or your underwear. And you had to take, make a half hitch and take this string and tie a, a bow and hang your clothing. There were no clothespins, you see. These were the clothespins. And you, if that wasn't made with a half hitch, that was part of running around that grinder. I'm there washing my clothes one night, and this big guy comes over. Hey, Norm, I can't tie a half hitch. He's crying because he, he was so afraid that if he didn't have the the right knot on his underwear at the inspection that we would all run around because he didn't have... Did you teach him how to tie Yeah, him? I did. Cause did I, 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 oh, yeah. Because, uh, as I said earlier, I had boats and I knew, I knew my knots. So, But that's part of the discipline, you see. If one person... Uh, How did your military service affect your life? Well, I think uh, the World War II experience was good. The Korean experience left a bad taste, I mean, because I saw such a waste, a complete waste of manpower and uh, material. And I think the military, I don't know how it operates today, but I surmise that it's some of that is still there. You know, the Navy had a hard time in the beginning of the war the, the Battle of Guadalcanal and Iron Bottom Bay, we had officers that uh, shouldn't have been there. They, you know, you see, you have to go, prior to World War II, 
You know, you're just coming out of depression. And I can remember as a kid, there was a fellow across the street that was in the army. And anybody who was in the service during the depression had it made. They could send like $30 a month home. They had a job. And a lot of these people got in there and stayed there for years and they weren't qualified to be there. Enlisted men as well as officers. In the beginning of World War II, the regular Navy, a lot of them were, you know, down south where it was, it was poorer than it was up north and they didn't have the education and so forth. And these were people that were caught at the beginning of the war trying to fight a war and there were a lot of officers that weren't qualified to be there. Therefore, we lost, you know, we lost a lot of those battles. We had a boatswain's mate, Bodford, Bonnie Bodford, nice guy, down south, South Carolina. And I can remember standing for mustard uh, at the World War I barracks in Norfolk when we were forming up as a crew. And Fred Vance, the executive officer, told this story later on at one of the reunions. Bonnie Bodford could not read. He sat down, he came to Fred Vance and said, Fred, I can't read, but if you read me the mustard list once, I will remember every name on that list. And he held that paper in front of him and he faked it. He, he called the mustard. No one ever knew. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview or any other stories or incidents? Well, I think this is, uh, my story is probably typical of uh, many World War II. I mean, we uh, we didn't, you know, I would say the majority probably never saw a lot of action, especially in the Navy. I mean, you know, there were a lot of battles fought, but there were also a lot of people, and not everyone was in the, in the front lines. Same way with the Army, but the Army, of course, did, you know, uh, that was their, they were ground forces. But the Navy, I think mine is probably a, a typical, you know, we saw, you know, very limited action, uh, no damage to the, you know, ship through enemy action or anything, because uh, it was near the end of the war. Uh, the only thing we had to worry about were the suicides, but the early part of the war, you know, where they had real shooting battles, uh, a lot of a lot of ships were lost. In fact, well, I'd like to thank you for your interview, and I'd also like to thank you for your service. You're welcome. <laughs>